need the Lord's help, especially when we turn to his truth, his eternal word. These are spiritual issues we're dealing with. Um, we need the Lord, the power of the Spirit, to take the word, to penetrate the word, and to drive the word into every one of our souls today. Let us pray. O oh, Father, we thank thee for this beautiful morning. We thank thee for thy goodness to us. We thank thee and we praise thee. You are God and beside thee there is none else. We thank thee you are the eternal one. We bless thee and we praise thee. You are the God who is self-sufficient, the great I am, the one who has created this universe and sustains it by the word of thy power. We thank thee, thou art God and beside thee there is none else. You are the great God of heaven, the great God of redemption, the great God of salvation, the great God of justification, sanctification, the great God of redemption. And we thank thee we have redemption through Christ's blood, even the forgiveness of sins. We thank thee the God who delivers the sinner and takes them out of darkness into thy marvelous light. We thank thee you're a God who is mighty to save. You're the God who can take people out of the dunghill and set them among princes. We bless him. We praise our great name. You're a God who delighteth in mercy. You're a God of inexhaustible love and compassion and mercy and grace. But, O oh God, we're mindful in your word. You're also a God who is holy, 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 is the Lord God of hosts. You're a God of perfect justice. You're a God of also wrath. And, Lord God, yet your way is perfect. Your justice is perfect. As for God, his way is perfect. We thank thee, you're a God of revelation. We thank thee for the revelation of thy word today, that we can expound it and learn more and be transformed and sanctified through the truth today. We pray, O oh God, for the power of the Spirit. We thank thee for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, who dwells within every believer, who testifies of Jesus Christ. And we pray today that Christ will be honoured, Christ will be glorified, Christ will be lifted up. Father, we thank thee for thy glorious begotten Son, the Eternal One, the One who came into this sin-cursed, ruined, fractured, wicked, debased world. And, O oh God, the One who, who became flesh, yet without sin, the One who went to a cruel tree, a cruel cross, to redeem a people unto himself. Thank thee, Lord God, in this gathering this morning that many have experienced that redemption, know their sins forgiven, Know their sins are purged. Know the peace with God. Know that the eternal life dwell within them through the Spirit. Know that assurance that it's well with their souls, sealed by the Holy Ghost, on their road to glory heaven. We pray, Father, this morning, if there's any, Lord God, not saved, still in their sin, still in the broad road that leadeth to destruction, I pray, O oh God, through the power of the Spirit, we thank Thee as office is to convict of sin, righteousness, and of judgment to come. I pray, give people reality where they stand before a holy God. And Lord God, we thank thee and we praise thee that thou art building thy church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We thank thee, our God cannot fail. You're the sovereign ruler of this universe. We bless thy holy name today. We glorify thee. We worship thee. We exalt thee. We pray, Father, for every church sat like this today across our land, Lord God. Across the world, O oh Father, you bless every faithful servant who proclaims the unsearchable riches of Christ today. And O oh God, it will please thee that many souls will pass from death unto life. Bless us here today. We need thy help for Jesus Christ's second glory. Amen. And amen. Just as I said there a few minutes ago, going back six months ago or so, we were looking at different characters over that seven or eight week period of driving services because of the COVID restrictions. And today I think it's wise just to continue regarding our character studies. We're going to look at this character, this old prophet called Elisha. And I'm going to take you back approximately 28, 2,800 years ago regarding an incident. There was many incidents and many miracles this old prophet Elisha performed by the grace of God and the power of God. But th today we're going to look at Elisha or Elisha. He's traveling along this road towards Bethel. And the Bible speaks about different roads, but two main roads. There's a broad road that leadeth to destruction, that horrendous place called hell. But there's also that narrow path which leads to life, eternal life in Jesus Christ, that great place called heaven. 
So today here we're going to look at this situation, these three verses we're going to unpack by God's grace regarding this character called Elisha. Elisha had been Elijah's servant and apprentice for around 10 years, but now it was time for the Lord to call his courageous servant Elijah home. It seems that both of God's servants had different characters, different personalities, as Elijah was noted as the son of thunder, and Elisha being more tender as a gracious healer. In general, Elijah came like John the Baptist, as Elisha's ministry came in a sense like the Lord Jesus Christ. But just before Elijah's departure, when he was translated to heaven, Elijah did not taste death, like, like also like Enoch, God took them before the grave. And just before his translation, translation to heaven, Elisha asked his spiritual father, Elijah, for a double portion of his spirit, in which his request was granted as Elisha performed 16 miracles, which is recorded, and Elijah performed eight miracles. As Elisha was heading northeast along the Jericho road towards Bethel, he knew what to expect in a sense. In verse 23 of the passage we have read this morning, it says, And he went up from thence unto Bethel. For a few minutes I'm going to speak on this area, on this location called Bethel. It is very important from the scriptures. And this man, Elisha, God's prophet, was going towards this place, Bethel. Sadly, Bethel had fallen away spiritually as there was no proper solid theological seminary there in Elisha's day. Bethel was once linked to Abraham on his altar as well as with Jacob on his staff in which Bethel was prescribed as the house of God. What a wonderful name in those days it was prescribed and allocated to as the house of God. But sadly, there was a great apostasy a pernicious cult which had made itself at home in Elisha's day. Think of it, the house of God was now in the hands of the enemy, the seat of false religion. This was the place where Jacob witnessed the shining stairway, Jacob's ladder. I'm sure most of us are aware, read that in the scriptures, and learned a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. The great apostasy at Bethel began with Jeroboam, the first king of Israel after Solomon, in which the kingdom was divided into two, the northern kingdom, ten tribes of Israel, and the southern tribe, tribes, the two tribes, southern kingdom of Israel. Jeroboam made Israel to sin, the Bible tells us, as he set up two golden calves, one at Bethel and the other at Dam. It was a convenient religion on a political move by Jeroboam because he was afraid of his citizens from the ten tribes of the northern kingdom to go down to Jerusalem, the southern kingdom, to the temple, Solomon's temple, to worship in which was God's ordained way, prescribed way, in case his citizens were influenced and sided with the southern kingdom, King Rehoboam. Because of Jeroboam's restriction on convenient religion for the northern kingdom by setting up these two golden calves, it did not take too long for the Bethel calf cult to dominate the entire religious life of the citizens in the northern kingdom. Everything had become a travesty of the truth in Bethel. What a downfall from the days of Abraham. Scripture was misrepresented to suit their audience as the golden calf, their religious calendar, the college of priests and their ministers on the false altar were all satanic imitations of the true worship of God established in Jerusalem. They had twisted God's word to suit their own agenda, their selfish terms. They were liberal as they denied some of the teachings of the Old Testament, such as the second commandment, thou shalt not make any unto thee any graven image, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, yet they had set up two graven images, the two golden calves, one at Bethel and one at Dan, which made the citizens of the northern kingdom to sin. Dear friends, there's no difference today 
many are sad to say are liberal, that abuse God's word, they misrepresent it, they fear man and they fear God, it is only a career to them, and they don't preach the true gospel of repentance and sin and heaven and hell, they don't preach that you need to be saved, it's all lovely wee stories and it's an absolute deception, they don't preach the truth and love, they're deceiving multitudes. They are liberal, and that is what has happened in this case, in this setting, regarding in Elisha's day as he goes towards Bethel. Bethel itself was only about 12 miles north of Jerusalem, in which its Bible college was probably founded originally by the great prophet Samuel, just over a century previous. Samuel, in his itinerant ministry, would have visited the Bible college in Bethel at least once a year, upholding the truth of God's word. But by the time in the days of Elisha, the godly old prophet Samuel would have turned in his grave, as the saying, if he had known what was going to happen the college he had founded. This trend, folks, seems to be, in most cases, that few Bible colleges remain true to their convictions and intentions of their fathers. By the third generation, it seems if there has not been any great movement by the Spirit of God, then generally there is need of revival. The first generation are men and women of great conviction as they grasp and contend hold of the truths of Scripture. There is no compromise as they are devoted to God and moved by conviction they are even prepared to die for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are passionate, they are zealous for the things of God as they have counted the cost, being cross bearers and good soldiers of Jesus Christ. They preach the whole counsel of God. They preach Christ and him crucified. They live godly lives and send out missionaries. Their life is consumed with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the preeminent one in their lives. They hate sin and love righteousness. The challenge is this morning, I wonder how is your devotion, how is your passion, your zeal for the things of God? Is your convictions the same or are you letting them slip? Your Is your fear of God still the same or is it slipping as you're being conditioned to the modern fleshly programs of the secular so-called modern church? What about the second generation? The general pattern is the great truths in which they have been raised in has become a belief. They haven't the same convictions as the first generation. There's a slipping away. They've heard their fathers teach them around the family altar on dinner table. Believe in these great truths of the scriptures and are even willing to debate them. They carry on the traditions and programs of their fathers, but the age of their conviction is gone. Then we have the third generation. As the degeneration goes even further, as the biblical standards become compromised, the belief now becomes an opinion. They are willing to compromise God's truth, God's word, dilute the message, sugarcoat the message, accept other ideas, bargain it away, and when the battle becomes too hot, they even walk away or sacrifice truth so that there would be no offence, no contention with the world. They preach a superficial half so-called gospel. They do not preach the, all the attributes of God. They misrepresent God and his holiness to accommodate for man, which is really a deception, a manipulation, yet the true gospel is an offence showing a person who is not saved is under condemnation, is under damnation, the wrath of God still being in their sin, who need a saviour. I wonder today, are you still in your sin? Are you not saved? The Bible speaks many, many times about that word saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Look unto me all the ends of the earth and be you saved. It speaks many, many times. Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. What does it mean about being saved? Dear friends, this is essential. This is the most important issue of life. 
What does it mean about being saved? What does the Bible mean about being saved? It means being saved from your sin. You see, your sin separates you from God. And if you hold on to your sin, you'll perish, folks. And I say that in love. You'll be lost forever in that horrendous place of God's judgment and hell. This is why you need to be saved. Your sin's cleansed. Your sin's cast away forever purged by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's repenting, being saved from God's wrath because God will punish sin. And God punished sin through his son 2,000 years ago. But dear friends, if you don't avail, if you don't appropriate, if you don't repent and receive Christ as your own and personal saviour, you're still holding on to your sin. The sin issue hasn't been dealt with. And folks, God will judge you for that. That's why you need to be saved. And the Bible emphasizes time after time, verse after verse in the Old Testament, but especially in the New Testament, about this word saved. Apart from revival... Generally speaking, the church, the Bible colleges, the mission, the ministry will continue to degenerate. We see it at first hand, the reality in this generation in the West. The apostasy, the great falling away, it is right in front of us in this generation. In this land, in the United Kingdom, right across Europe, right across America and the West. Praise God, he's moving in great power in other parts of the world, especially in the East. There's a real hunger, there's a real thirst, there's a real move of the Spirit. But folks, in our generation in the West, sadly, the apostasy, there's a great apostasy, there's a great falling away, there's a great indifference, there's a lack of interest and lack of concern. The old prophet Habakkuk cried out being broken for his nation Israel, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in in the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. Oh, how we all need to be revived by God's power through the Spirit and the Word in these days of deception, of indifference, of lukewarmness, of carelessness, of lack of faith, and so forth. Dear friends, oh God, we need the Lord to help us, the church as a whole, generally speaking. I'm not speaking in every situation, but generally speaking, we need to be revived in the midst of these years. And Lord, the Lord to have mercy upon this land. The fallen away is horrendous. And dear friends, when people reject God and reject the gospel, the glorious, wonderful news of redemption of a glorious Savior who came into the world to save sinners, when they reject God's wonderful salvation in Jesus Christ, there's only one alternative. Downward judgment when God leaves a nation over themselves and wallow in their sin and perish. Oh, how we need the Lord's mercy. How in his wrath, remember mercy, the old prophet Habakkuk says. But in the case, as we go back here to the passage, in the case of the Bible college in Bethel, many generations had passed since Samuel the four founder of this college it had degenerated to such a degree it was beyond any hope of revival as there was nothing to revive as apostasy had taken over yes their religious false professors teachers at Bethel had their large salaries their grammar their nice speeches their degrees their fine clothing their sophistication their worldly culture backed by the authorities they were articulated they were well polished but Alicia, the difference was, Alicia had the word of God and the power of God in which judgment was sealed for Bethel and the northern kingdom of Israel because of its wicked liberalism, idolatry and cultism in Alicia's day. What a fallen away. You can see the pattern, the parallelism in our own land today. I'm sure Alicia was not much to look at, not glamorous, not stunning, not attractive from the world's perspective. Elisha was not old, but yet he was already bald, it says. In verse 23, it says, Thy bald head, go up thy bald head. He wasn't attractive to look at. They were mocking Elisha because of his appearance of being bald, which was a gross offense, especially in Israel, as grey hair was a crown of glory among the Jews. Proverbs 16 tells us that. They were looking at the outward appearance in their rash judgment, yet Elisha was more spiritual and in touch with God than them, them and their religious leaders all put together at Bethel. It is a true saying in many cases, never judge a book by its cover. Even the great prophet Samuel 
made that mistake when God told them to go down to the house of Jesse and anoint the new king of Israel who will take over the office from Saul. Jesse had eight sons and some were very strong, some were very athletic, some were full of vitality. So when Samuel seen Eliab, Abinadab and Shammah who were the oldest, Samuel thought to himself, one of these has to be the Lord's anointed to be the next king of Israel. But the Lord told Samuel, as he witnessed the seven brothers out of the eight, that none of them was chosen to be the next king. So there was only one remaining, the youngest, who was out shepherding the sheep, David, in which the scriptures say he was a man after God's own heart. David had a a pastoral heart. His name was David. And when they fetched David, the Lord said to Samuel, this is the man to be the next king. Anoint him. For man, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And dear friends, the Lord knows every single person's heart, not just in this small gathering and this driving service this morning, but also across Balm Bridge, across this whole province, across the United Kingdom, across Southern Ireland, across this whole world, 7.8 billion people, even the hairs of our head are numbered. God knows everyone's heart. He even knows their thoughts afar off, what they're even going to think. Nothing can be hidden from God. He searches every heart. He understands the imagination of thoughts. And the Lord knows who are his, who are in Christ, who are saved. And he knows who are still in their sin, not saved. Elisha's heart, you see, was in vital touch with the living God. Just like the Apostle Paul. He might not have been impressive to look at. But nevertheless he was in very close communion with God. Being strong in the Lord and the power of his might. The challenge is, is your faith getting stronger in the Lord? Maybe some saved 50 years, 40, 30, 20, 10. Maybe some he's only saved a, a year or so forth. But the challenge is, I trust that my faith is getting stronger in the Lord. And your faith is getting stronger in the Lord. Because the Bible reminds us. The just shall live by faith. It's present tense. It's a going on with God by his grace. The just, that's God's people, shall live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. How can our faith increase, folks? It's by studying God's word. Because faith cometh by hearing and by hearing the word of God. It's studying this book, knowing God's promises and knowing God. How do we get to know God? It's through prayer and through the word. And that will increase our faith and strengthen our faith in him. But as we move on very quickly, in verse 23, the King James Version says, They were little children in the tax that mocked Elisha as he came towards Bethel. Little children. But actually in the Hebrew, when you study it, it means youths, young men, which can refer to people ranging from the age group from 12 to 30 years old. 12 to 30 years old. The same expression was used for Isaac. When he was 28 years old. These young men were fully aware of what they were doing. And fully responsible of their actions. It doesn't, ha- it, it, it doesn't say what the age they were. But they were not bracket between 12 and 30. It is possible they could have been students from the liberal apostate Bible college in Bethel. Which were opposed to Elisha. His faithful ministry unto the Lord, which exposed their religious deceptions and errors and heresies. Folks, it's never, it's always been the same one from the very beginning, from the prophets, true prophets of God, right through to the apostles and so forth, and ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is normally religious people who are actually opposed to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Think of the Pharisees, 6,000 or so in Jesus' day, and the Sadducees, these religious leaders. Who were the main opposition for Christ? It was these religious people. And it was no different in the days of Elisha or the prophets of old. You see, folks, religion, religious people, self-righteous religious people oppose the true gospel of grace. It's by grace that you're saved. Man has no part in it. It's all of God's grace. It's by grace that you're saved. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift from God. This was a gang of mockers, scoffers, smart aleck youths, maliciously ridiculing God and God's true servant, Elisha. 
as he was making his way towards Bethel. You see, folks, it's a very dangerous thing to mock or to belittle God's true servants because ultimately it is an attack on God himself. When Saul of Tarsus was on his way to Damascus with the intention of persecuting, persecuting the true Christians, the true church, the Lord stopped him in his tracks. And he said, Saul said, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. At this, as this gang of young men were mocking God's servant, the old prophet Elisha, repeating in verse 23, Go up thy bald head, go up thy bald head. They were repeating, they are mocking. Elisha, knowing the word of God, had understanding they were violating the covenant of God, decided to call down a curse upon them. One of the covenant warnings was that God would send wild beasts to attack the people. Leviticus 26 tells us that. These young men had no respect for God or his servant, Elisha. So they had to be judged. Verse 24, And he turned back us, Elisha, and looked on them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children of them. Paul reminds us in the New Testament, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If it's not on this side of eternity, it certainly will be when they die in their sin at the great white throne judgment. People think being deluded in their sin, of course, and being deceived by the devil, that they can sin high-handed, continue on in their sin high-handed, put their fist up against God. We will not have this man, Christ Jesus, to rule over us. And they think they can get away with it because God has not judged them there and then. But there comes, folks, a cut-off point. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. In judgment, God in his providence sent out two birds to maul these mocking ewes, which either seriously injured them or even killed some, but the ones that remained, their scars reminded them that they could not make little or trifle with the Lord and his servant and get away with it lightly. Verse 24, And he took them, turned them, and he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tore forty and two children of them. It is interesting to note in verse 24 that the number was 42 who were struck by the burrs. And the number 42 is associated to the Antichrist, the second part of the Great Tribulation period, just preceding the second coming of Christ. 42 months, months the Bible speaks about in the book of Revelation. 42 months, three and a half years when the Antichrist will have prominent power during the last part of the Great Tribulation, but will come to a swift and sudden end, him and, the, him and the false prophet, when the Lord Jesus returns in blazing glory, who will cast him immediately into the lake of fire. You frequently find in the Scriptures the Lord sending special judgments at the beginning of a new period in Bible history. God killed Aaron's two disobedient sons, Nadab and Abab Abihu, for offering strange fire and abusing their office. After Israel's first victory in the Promised Land in the days of Joshua, God commanded Achan to be killed after stealing treasures. What about the early church in the New Testament? In the early church, Ananas and Sapphire were struck down in their pride after lying to the leaders in Jerusalem. Oh, how the fear of God, God to be revered, 
God to be respected, needs to be manifested in our land again, even amongst the people of God who need to hate sin and love righteousness. You see, the psalmist reminds us, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of his saints. This God I present today is the God of the Bible, the eternal God, the one who is omnipotent, the all-powerful, sovereign God, in which we our breath is in his hands. In him we live and move and have our being. This God is the one who is the great I am, he said to Abraham, meaning he is the self-existent God, his very being of being. God does not depend on anyone or need anyone. We need him. Every one of us, our step is between life and death, and God gives us our very breath. This is the one who is holy. This is the one in which the angels veil themselves in his presence. He is perfect in holiness. He is without sin. He is a consuming fire and glory. One stroke, folks, from God would eliminate this whole universe. It would crumble. He sustains it by the word of his power. This is the one who is the almighty, all-powerful, eternal God who cannot fail. Is it any wonder the Hebrew writer could say it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God? God heard his servants cry on them, Elisha, and the two birds came out and mauled 42 of them. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. God controls every realm, folks. He controls the animal kingdom. He controls the natural elements. He controls nature. He controls every spiritual kingdom. He controls all things. No one can stay his hand. You see, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I wonder, as I close this message today, do you fear God? It is wise to fear God because the beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. Are you saved? I've mentioned that a number of minutes ago. What it means to be saved from your sin is your sin. The sin issue you've been dealt with. Has the account been settled? Is all your sins gone as far as the east is from the west? So far he's removed my transgressions from me. How, are you saved from the wrath to come? Dear friends, Christ is coming back in blazing glory with his angels and holy fire to strike this earth, to come in, in, in holy fire and also to judge the inhabitants of this earth and to cast the enemy into the bottomless pit on the, on the false prophet as well as the antichrist into the lake of fire. Are you prepared for the second coming of Christ? You see, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago as a servant, as a humble servant. But folks, he's coming back in blazing glory to claim back which is rightfully his, to set up his kingdom. Are you prepared for the, the return of Christ? You see, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Are you saved? Are you in Christ? Are you a new creature? Have you been baptized by the Spirit into Christ? Are you saved, born again of his Spirit? You see, folks, if you're not on a say this in love, you're, you're still in the, the mocking process. You still do not fear God, truly, which leads to judgment, which leads to that horrendous place, the lake of fire. Be wise today. Be on the pathway for glory. There's only two paths, the broad way, which leads to destruction, but then there's a narrow path which leads to glory, heaven. Surely if you're wise, which path do you want to be on today? Is it Jesus Christ, the path of righteousness, the path of holiness, the path of glory, the path of eternal life? Folks, if you're not on that path today, I encourage you, I beseech you, I urge you, be wise when there's time because our breath is in God's hand and at any time he could take it in a split second. No one knows what tomorrow will bring forth. Are you still in your sin? Be wise and realize, humble yourself before God. Realize you've broken his law. Realizing you're a sinner. Realizing that you need your sins forgiven. Repent, turn away from your sin and receive Christ, his salvation. The only way to escape the wrath to come. And the great news is, Jesus says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved. Are you saved today? 
That is the most important issue in life, more than anything else, to have your sins forgiven, peace with God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Are you in that personal, living, dynamic, supernatural relationship today with Jesus Christ? It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I trust today that you've made your peace with the living God and all is well with your soul. So we've looked today just at this small account. There's many accounts regarding this great prophet, Elisha, but we've looked at this account today, how he went towards Bethel, and how, how these young men, as they were mockers and scoffers, and you can see it in this generation, the parallelism, the falling away, the apostasy, the falling away, and how God came and judged. Be wise today. And trust in Christ before judgment comes. May the Lord bless these few words to us this afternoon. Thanks again for your patience. Thanks for coming. And I trust you have a good week. And I trust you know the Lord's presence and blessing upon your own soul. We'll have a word of prayer. Thank you. Father, we thank thee for this opportunity to share the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank thee for your son. We thank thee for the provision and the remedy. And the antidote there is in Christ to have peace with thee. And, O oh God, to be prepared to meet thee. I pray, Father, for the people of God today. Help us, Father, to fear thee even more. You are God. We are mortal man. In a split second, O oh God, you could take this universe. You are the almighty, all-powerful God. And help us, O oh God, to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. That will be like Alicia, strong in the Lord and the poor of his might. Lord God, I pray you'll increase our faith in these days and you'll bless us. And Father, if there's any inner gathering not saved, still in the broad road that leadeth to destruction, I pray in your wonderful mercy that you will reveal Christ to them and help them see the urgent need that they need a Savior to escape the wrath to come. I pray, Lord God, now as we separate, I pray you'll watch over us and you'll bless us. And Lord God, you'll keep us safe until we meet up again, if it's your will, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Thanks again, folks, for coming. The Lord bless you. Thank you.